Viewer discretion is advised. Oops, in the building. Uh, he's a former politician. He's an activist, and uh, you have an Oscar-nominated Oscar short film. Yeah, man, yeah, yeah. you are a All busy man. <laughs> <laughs> man, busy is an understatement. Well, welcome to Pigston, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank y'all for having me. We wanted to, uh, we wanted to start off a little bit and ask uh, a little bit about your yes. uh, battle rap uh, life and everything. When did you get started in battle rap? Um, I got started in battle rap. So actually, um, this realm of battle rap. Before this, I went to school with, uh, I went to high school with Big Will, who was a freestyle champion on 106 in part. Um, Gritz Hoffa, who was a who's a you know great artist from St. Louis, local artist. Um, but then in college, I went to school with Aver oh, and okay. a couple other folks. And so, like seeing them battle rap, it was on a different realm because at that time, you know, things were still over a beat, you know, for the most part. And um, I wasn't really heavy into it. I started off with music. I had songs on the radio in St. Louis. Um, had a couple deals, had a deal on the table, did a lot of writing for a lot of different artists, um, got a lot of placements with my music as well. So that's where I came from. And then um, O, who owned Street Status, who's like a brother to me, he came to me and was like, hey, I got this platform. If you want to push your music a little more, um, get your name out there, get, get a bigger following, you should start battle rapping. And that's when I did my first official battle um on street status 2012 i believe in december of 2012 if i'm not mistaken um and after that you know it started off as just a promotional tool but quickly as as life progressed and as things started to happen and change my direction of thinking and my narrative i fell in love with it because i, I knew that i could now get a message out to uh tens of thousands hundreds of thousands even a million people um and i was gonna make sure that i said something when i did so yeah i was gonna ask you about that if you did use battle rap to to push your message um oh. how much of that got sidetracked in 2014 oh it, so before before my daylight um i'll say before my old red battle oh i battled O red in 2014 of november that was right around a decision when they decided not to charge Darren Wilson for the murder of Michael Brown. Mm -hmm. um, by then I had been in the street since August. If you look at my battles before that, um, Mr. Mills, uh, my first RBE battle with Blu-ray and some of my earlier battles, like I talked about the same thing everybody else talked about. Mm -hmm. You know, I had good, you know, what I thought were good metaphors. Um, when you talk about guns and so on and so forth. But Old Red Battle was my first battle where I was like, you know what? Let me try to do something in this third round. And it worked. That battle got, that was my highest view battle at the time. It got 300, 400,000 views. Um, our third round went viral. And then after that, uh, it was time for daylight. And at that point, when I went into my third round, I knew that that's what was supposed to happen. But the death of Michael Brown and my my introduction, you know, uh, unfortunately, into activism is what changed my whole thought process in battle rap. Because at that point, it was no more about winning. It was mm -hmm. no more about, um, you know, trying to win around. It was it was about the message and, and how many people were going to be captivated by what I say. That's amazing. That, yeah. Wow, man. Um, so that all led into you getting into politics and activism, th those events. And man, you've done a lot too. You, you, <laughs> There's just so reading, much I want to cover. I know. But it's, <laughs> it's where to begin. <laughs> you know, you saved, you saved the summer youth program for yeah. your state. Yeah. That is. Yeah, that's. Um, almost every state has a summer youth job yes. program, right? Um, it's been there for, you know, as I'm pretty sure long as we can remember. Um, 
in my state, you think about places like St. Louis, Missouri, you think about places like Kansas City, mm -hmm. um, who have their high crime ridden areas, who have their most economically distressed communities um, in the state. But then you also think about our rural areas yes. uh, that, you know, they go through some of the same things as far as poverty, as far as lack of education. And so those programs helped not only um, young people that look like me, but it helped our, our poor and most vulnerable around the entire state. And our governor at the time, who was an absolute idiot, um, their budget took that $6 million um, down to zero. Mm. And he did it not even knowing that, that that money didn't come from the general fund. He just did it to just to be spiteful. Mm. And so I worked across the aisle with uh, with a few Republicans who I took to my district and said, look, this is why this program is important. Um, the budget chair who who is the, you know, he's the most important part person in a, in a budget process as far as hierarchy or whatever, um, they supported it. And so I had bipartisan support um, to put $6 million in. And by the time I left office, um, I had put $9.5 million into the budget for our summer jobs program. Wow. That is that huge. Is, that's huge. These programs do really need to be there. Um, we've actually participated in those programs in Oklahoma. When we mm -hmm. ran our own mm -hmm. business, we had kids that were brought it, that the state came to us and, um, in Oklahoma, the Indian tribes also have their own funds Absolutely. for it. And so the tribe came to us and we had kids from the tribe and from the state that, because uh, we ran, we were running IT and those kids wanted to learn more and they yep. needed the opportunity to know what those kind of businesses really were like. Absolutely. And it gives them work experience, mm -hmm. real work experience. Yes. Right. Um, it, it's a lot of, a lot of the youth around the United States. It's their first job. Um, it's their introduction into the workforce. And so we, we had the program so unique to where it's not only were they going in and getting jobs, but they were getting bank accounts. They were getting financial literacy, financial empowerment, 24 right. hour mentoring, um, like all the, this whole package of help, you know, and we wouldn't have been able to do that without that 9.5 million. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you, you protested for 400 consecutive days. Me and me and a whole crew of warriors um what what was that like my, during that time frame like from, oh man from, i mean you you you've been arrested several times you'd been uh they tried to silence you like mm -hmm. what what was that like just that that passion that emotion what you know emotions had to be running high obviously yeah. at the at the time you don't think about it at the time when because it, it started August 9th, 2014, mm -hmm. you know, and it went past August 9th, 2015. Uh, we were in the streets 400 days and 400 plus days. And when you're out there, um, it was adrenaline, right? You, you're just running on adrenaline, you're running on emotion, you're running on passion, um, you're running on anger, you're using all of these different things to fuel you. Um, now looking back on it, um i am um, you know i was tired i was i was i was distraught i was depressed i was um going through so much trauma and so many of us were going through trauma then that we didn't even know it's funny that somebody said um uh, you know they begin to put a shirt on and it's more to it um with me even wearing this because i remember at a time when i was when I was doing all of that and I was so stressed, I was very, very unhealthy. Mm -hmm. I was very, uh, I lost the, you know, I, I wasn't, I've never been really big, but I was really, 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 really small, right? And it just mm -hmm. came from this place of being unhealthy. And now in my life, um, I am healthy. I'm healthy physically. Um, I'm healthy mentally most of the time. And so I enjoy, you know, the way that I look because now I finally can recognize myself you know, and right. so it's, you know, being out there was, being out there was rough. And a lot of people always wonder why, right? Like, why are, why were you guys out there 400 days? Well, you got to think about it. After Michael Brown, after Michael Brown was killed, somebody in St. Louis got killed by the police every month for the next year and a half. Oh. Every single month. And from the time, August 19th, the next, August 9th, 2014, Kajim Powell was killed. 
August 9, 2015, while we're at a protest commemorating and remembering Kajin Powell, we get a call that Mansour Balbay is killed by the police. Mm -hmm. So it was a constant protest because we still had people dying every day, you know, so. Yeah, we looked up the stats on how many officers ever get, out of 100, how many officers actually get charged with a crime for these Convicted, incidents. one out of 100 get one convicted. One out of 100. Like three out of 100 even get charged. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Say that number again for everybody watching. One out of 100 officers gets convicted. Three out of 100 just get charged. Now think of it this way. three out of a hundred. So they're saying that 97 out of that hundred goes under. Are absolute. Oh, they, they were justified is basically what the system is saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The system is saying 97 out of a hundred, 97%. If you watch baseball, if you have somebody that bats 400, that's amazing. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's less than half of their at best. Policing is the only profession, is the only place where we are telling people, you know what? We are right 97% of the time. I 100% disagree with that. And, and you know, <laughs> it saddens me. Well, it, it, it just what... I, oh man, I've, I've, we've okay, been we've been of, fueled let, about this for a while. Let's let's be real. Out of a hundred, just murders. Out of a hundred, just murders. There ain't ninety seven of those people that go free. True, and that's not police. Like just regular murders. Ninety seven percent so are are on death row or in prison. It's but the somehow, exact right. opposite. Right. Right. So we have a problem, you know, and it's. It, it, it affects every up, community um, as a whole. It does. And it absolutely does. The, the fight for Black Lives Matter is very important because that's, that's the community most affected, but it affects all of us. Every community has these injustices. Yes. Because that 100 they were talking about, it didn't discriminate or pull apart by who what color the people were that the police shot at that was just a hundred shootings by police officers so yeah police brutality is, is is real it's we all have to pull together and and talk about it and yeah Man, and, we, and, and and to take it a step further like you know and being all the way honest with you like the time for talking is over I feel right? that like, right now. We 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 know, we know black, white, whoever you are. If by now people can't understand or fathom that black folks are dying disproportionately, because I got into a not an argument because I don't really argue. I enlighten, and I had a conversation, and, and a white gentleman told me that just as many white people die at the hands of the police as that's, black folks. And I said correct. you are. I said, but this is the thing. I said, as far as number wise, you're absolutely right. The problem is we're only 17% of this population. Yes. We are only 17, but we are only less than 15, not even 17. We are less than 15% of this population. And if we dying at the hand, at the, at, at the at same, just as many as the majority, that's a problem. That, that is a big problem. problem. That's a problem. And, and what else, what else do we have to talk about? Right. Like what other conversations need to be had? What, what, when we all sit down at the table, we all sit down at this table together, what exactly are we going to talk about that's going to move us forward to get the system to understand that Black Lives Matter? We've talked about everything. Yes. One, of the, one of the things we like, to, we like to impress upon younger generations is that you you got to get out there you have to vote you have to get rid of these old politicians that have been in office for for who knows how long since before i was born and no changes have been made my entire life 
Well, not enough. Not anyway. enough of a change anyways. They and might, the they might do a little bit. So can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. Yes. And I mean, being a former elected official, being somebody who, I don't believe in a system, but I believe in being civically engaged because when we don't, when we don't take advantage of that system, of that, of that civic engagement, then it's hard to hear our voices even yes. more than it is now. So yes. I, I, that's the part I agree with as far as the system and, and voting being one of the caveats we can, you know, we can stick a pin in there and, you know, whatever, whatever makes sense, whichever way the wind blows. Mm -hmm. This is my thing right now. I'm all for voting. I think that should be the narrative. Right now though, at this, at this pivotal moment in, in, in this country, I push back on putting voting in the top three, top five things that could be done right now. I can understand that. Understand. Because there is not a vote we could have made that's that would have kept yep. Ahmaud Arbery, no. Breonna Taylor, none of them alive, right? And right now we talking about Black lives dying, dying at the hands of the police. And I sat in, I sat, I'm sorry. I, it's okay, there I, have been changes. Yeah. I just want everybody just to not, be clear. Just not enough. Yeah, just not not. Let, and I'll I'll take it a step further, y'all. Not nearly enough. Mm -hmm. Not not a smidget remotely close to where we need to be. And I I sat in a room with Joe Biden, with Loretta Lynch, and President Obama's entire administration, September twenty second, two thousand fifteen, and heard them talk about and heard them uplift this message of we're going to give hundreds of millions of dollars to the police. We're gonna give the, these departments hundreds of millions of dollars for training and all these other things, right? Um, the current guy that's in office right now, he, he we, we are, I, as, as far as my personal opinion, he's a train wreck. <laughs> At the end of the day, say the least, it doesn't yeah. matter. It doesn't matter who's in office right now, we are dying at the hands of the police. We are dying in our communities. And even when we are dying in the community, no matter how many people like to say, oh, well, what about black on black crime? That idea of black on black crime is BS in the first place. But even if you want to label it as black on black crime, even black on black crime is systemic oppression from resources that's been stripped from our communities. When you talk about lack of education, resources, mm -hmm. um, undiagnosed mental health issues, all these redlining, all these things that have aided to poverty, mm -hmm. which, which feeds that crime yes. when they have this idea that they can contain crime. So it's, it's, yeah, voting is very important. And we should get these old, old damn people up out of here that's been here for years, absolutely. But it's right now, the way it's looking and the way it's going, we are gonna need way more of a radical change than just a political, just a radical political change. Yes. We are gonna need way more of a rebellion to, to get folks to understand. I, I, I don't want it to go there personally, right. but I am, I am ready 10 toes down for if it does, because whatever it has to do to, to ensure that, that my, my black children and my black grandchildren and my black grandchildren's grandchildren's grandchildren get to the day where they can walk around here and not worry about nothing, I'll, I'll put my life on the line tomorrow. And that's a lot, that, that says an absolute lot, because when anybody stands up and speaks, they do have a target on them. It's, ha Period. it's fact. It's history. Yeah. We already it's know history. it. We, we, there is no waffling about that. And that's, that's part of the problem. That to stand up and do the right thing, you get a target on you? Just yeah. to stand up and say, hey, you're not doing the right thing. And you have a target. And who's the, and who's the person that people like to bring up the most? They love to bring Martin Luther King up. Martin Luther King is one of the most amazing people to ever walk the face of this earth. Martin Luther King was one of the most nonviolent people. Martin Luther King didn't believe in, in violence. Um, Malcolm X did. Malcolm X was by any means necessary, and he's an amazing person. But at the end of the day, Martin Luther King was considered the most dangerous man in America when he mm -hmm. died, when he was murdered. Why? Be so, because, so, because he, 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 he spoke out 
and he influenced <laughs> people to follow a path that Absolutely. the government did not like at the time. Absolutely. And Absolutely. When our government <clears throat> isn't a true representation of the people, and it really isn't by the people and for the people. Oh, that ship sailed a long time ago. If it, if it even existed in yeah. the first place. Um, yeah, for, for us, it never existed. Yes. I, I like to believe that when Thomas Jefferson was writing all that, he hoped in the future there would be people that could make the changes that he wanted, that he wanted to see right, in the Cloud. world, that he didn't think he was man enough or brave enough to do himself. And so he left a lot of openings for us to do so much with our country. But we yeah, got to stand I, up and do it. Yeah, I feel where you're coming from. But it's hard, as black folks, it's hard to see that from a slave owner. I do. It's, it's, it's hard to see that from, from when it's, it's funny when people bring up. Um, and I went to the school I went to was 91% white. And I will always say this in school when they would talk about our forefathers. I said, what good is an illegitimate parent? Because that none of them were my forefathers. And at the end of the day, um, when you have Thomas Jefferson and some of these other uh, slave owners who, who raped their slaves, who, who did horrible things. And even when you talk about this country, um, it's funny how this parallel when I see when I see more conservative folks get out here and talk about the looting and the rioting more than what happened to um, the black lives that are laying in the streets. But um, the Europeans looted and rioted their way into a whole country. They looted <laughs> and rioted their way into a whole system. Yep. Right. They so did. looted and looted, looting and rioting worked for them. So 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 why can't it work for us? Right. What y'all, 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 y'all took land, y'all, you know, not y'all, but you know what I mean? I know what you mean. Um, they, you know, they took land and they took, they took goods and they took people and they, they, they had this idea that they can own people. Like what type of, what type of sadistic person are you to think that you can own somebody? And even today we celebrate Juneteenth and we celebrate Juneteenth as 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 our freedom, right? As our freedom day. But but realistically, the the slaves in Texas found out two years later yes. that they were free. Two years later, it was supposed to be 1863. They found out 1865 that they were free, and this is the day that we celebrate. You know, so when, it, when we talk about our the, the ideals of our country, I'm not so. Uh, I'm not as optimistic um, as as some of my some of my uh, European brothers and sisters um, when it comes to what the ideals of America could be and and what the forefathers meant because only thing I know is what they've shown me. Yes, and it is the line that you walk is the line that people remember, not what you said. So, what mm -hmm. what do you feel? would be a next logical step to implement that change. Radical change. Malcolm X had, Malcolm X had, um, I would implore anybody um, watching um, and even even y'all, if, if y'all haven't read it yet, but Malcolm X had, has a speech called The Ballad of the Bullet. And in this speech, he talks about, um, he specifically talks about the black community and he talks about how we have the power um, to put people in office and to take people out of office when it comes to the civic engagement. And what I, what I drew from, what I drew from the speech was that, um, each method was just as powerful as, as the other, mm -hmm. right? Whether we take the, take it to the ballot and we politically organize together as a people and say, ho, oh, this is what we're going to do. Hold on. This is, we, we are going to move in this way. These are our candidates and this is who we are pushing. Um, because the Democratic Party has banked on our vote for a long time and we have upheld, we have upheld our end of the bargain for a very long time, but they haven't upheld their, their end of the bargain to us. And so if we don't, if we don't, if we don't organize as a people, um, even looking down at the, the, the Alabama, um, Senate race a couple years back, um, that was, you know, without that, you know, without that Senator Jones, he doesn't get in. Without 
97% of black women showing up, 94% of black men showing up. We have, we get a racist ex KKK member um, who's a rapist in office if we don't show up in the state of Alabama. And so it's gonna take that, that radical political change as far as a entire sweep. And yes. when I say sweep, I mean federal, but mainly concentrating on our local elections from city council to mm -hmm. state rep to, to state senate to mayor to governor. Yes. Those, that, that needs to start first. And realistically outside of that, um, if that doesn't work, then we got we have to give them a war that they think they're ready for and they're really not. They're gonna find out how many people are actually on the same sides if it comes down to a, a Nat Turner um, type of rebellion because police were put in in place as 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 slave catchers, right? They were slave patrol and they caught slaves, they caught black folks, and they killed black folks. And it's 2020 and they still catching black folks and killing black folks, right? So how many times are we gonna turn the cheek? How many times are we gonna peacefully protest? How many times are we gonna nonviolently protest? How many times are we gonna believe in an electoral system that, ha that keeps failing us, in a justice system that keeps failing us, in an entire country that keeps failing us? What do we do next? There's no more talking, there's no more marching, there's no more, almost no more anything that we can do. And so once we get to that point, um, maybe, just maybe, um, that's what it's gonna take to, to get folks to truly understand. My mom used to tell me a whole lot of stuff, but it was when she smacked me upside my head. You got it. And I said, oh, she's serious. Yeah. She real. That makes sense to me. We might have to smack some folks upside their head. I'm, I'm not gonna disagree with that. We're in Texas, so you know, we see, <laughs> We see some of the same Southern things that have been going on way too long, but then we also, uh, you know, we have our own set of problems from mm -hmm. the border and all of that. And it becomes, I wonder almost if it becomes so much for the average citizen that they just, they can't grasp it all. And that there's just, it's overwhelming. And, and, you know, it, the real thing is, is we've got to start very much at the education level. If we can start teaching the children better, then, but how do you teach children better if the adults that are teaching them aren't themselves trying to be better? Because it ain't the children I'm worried about. I know. The, the children, the children, I got, I got a bunch of nieces and nephews that look nothing like me. And all they see is Uncle Bruce, Uncle Oops. Yeah. They don't see that I'm black. They don't see that, right? Like they the just same. don't see it. And it's, it's now it's like, like you said, who, who are we getting, a, who, who's gonna teach the kids? They can't teach the kids. Most of these folks can't teach our kids how not to be biased, how not to be, because they are, they are. And especially, um, you know, to just keep it real, when you talk about, when you talk about racism, right? And we talk about white supremacy and we talk about hitting it head on. I don't need my kids talk. My kids, unfortunately, they have a, they have a, a, a generational education that's embedded in their head about it. Right. What I, what I need is, not even the white kids. I need, I need the parents yes. to educate the other. I need the woke white parents to educate the non-woke white parents because it, I, I tried to tell one of my teachers, my old teachers, look, you taught me a whole lot in social studies back in when I was in seventh grade. But it's not my job to educate you on racism. It's not my job to, to continue to re-traumatize myself telling you these, these horrific stories, right? These, these horrific incidents. Um, there was a there was a video on my Twitter. Um, do I have time to talk about this real quick? Yeah, sure, go ahead. You got plenty of time. Okay. As much time um, as you want, man. There, there, there was a there was a video on my Twitter where I gave this this um, story. It was a true story. White man and um, I was serving with uh, Republican. He said, "I'm not black." 
I'm not black, so I can't I can't tell you what y'all go through. I can't feel what y'all go through. I don't know what you go through because I ain't black. So don't expect me to feel it. I said, cool, okay. I said, well, I'm not white. And I feel it. I said, uh, you have a wife. He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, you got kids. He said, yeah. I said, were you there when your kids were born? He said, absolutely. I said, your wife, when she was having your kids, I said, was she in pain? He said, yeah, she's in a lot of pain. I said, you sure? He said, yeah, she was in pain. I said, she couldn't have been in pain. He said, how the hell are you gonna tell me? I was there. I said, she couldn't have been in pain. He said, she was absolutely in pain. I said, how do you know she was in pain? He said, I heard her crying. I saw it. I, I was there. I could feel it. I said, you can feel it, you can hear her, and you can see it, but you didn't have to go through labor. You didn't have to have a baby. You didn't have to go through any of the physical things that she went through in order to see, hear, and feel that she was in pain. That's all we asking. We're not telling you you gotta be black. We know that's impossible. We just saying, see what's happening in the news. Hear our stories and our cries. Take a step back from your bias and feel what we're going through. Then you will truly understand or even halfway understand. I have to say that's one of the most powerful things I've ever heard anyone say. Um, excuse me. <laughs> it's, 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 you know what? When you, what we going through, and it's been hit me more lately, and I've been a lot more emotional lately, and realistically, I've, I've cried a lot more lately. I have four daughters and a son. All my kids are, are running around here right now. And these last couple months, I've always, I've always been on edge, you know, since I've been awakened. But these last couple months, I've just stared at my kids, cherished the moments, done whatever it is they wanted to do because other parents don't have to worry about the things that we have to worry about with our kids. They don't have to have the conversations we have with our kids. We don't get the, we don't get the, the luxury of preserving our kids' innocence. For six years, my kids have known about Michael Brown and about uh, police involved shootings and about racism and about a system that wasn't built for us and how to operate and how to continue to fight. And, and, and it's, it's very unpopular, but I told people, I don't have to just make it home safe conversation with my kids because my kids are my kids. My kids have me embedded in them, so they're gonna fight at all costs. So they know that there comes a time when you do something, not because it's popular, not because it's safe, not because it's political, but because your conscience tells you it's right, as Martin Luther King said. And that's something that we live by. I would love for my kids to make it home safe every day. I love them with everything in me, but my kids know to fight. We have to fight because the worst thing that anybody could do to you, whether it's the system or just a regular human being, is something that's gonna happen inevitably. So if it's going to happen, you might as well go down fighting. My six-year-old understands that. My 10-year-old understands that. My 13, 12-year-old understands that. My 16-year-old understands that. I look at them every day and, and think to myself, I don't know what I would do if this hits my front door. I don't know what. I would do if one of my babies is taken away because all of this goes out the window and that rebellion and that war comes a whole lot faster if it happens to mine. And unfortunately, even though it hasn't happened to mine, I'm, a lot of us are at that point. And it's so, it's, 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 it's a tough, it's really hard to deal with right now. It's, it's, it's a tough time. Like I've never seen so many people walking around, especially black folks walking around with just, even more heavier shoulders than they, they've had to deal with because of all of these things. COVID-19, all these different things that are just packing on top of each other. But social distancing doesn't, doesn't, doesn't know gun violence, right? Gun violence doesn't know social distancing. Police brutality doesn't know social distancing. 
But I, I saw a report that said there were no school shootings, and that's because no schools were in. Or but open. you know where there were still shootings at? Streets. In our communities. Each and every day. Sorry, I didn't mean to go. No, no. no. Was, we just, thank you. I think there's a lot of people that that need, need to you. hear this. It is. <laughs> it's an and it's a very powerful message, and you know, it, you're very good at, <laughs> at speaking it. We have been talking about there needs to be voices like yours, people who will stand up and and really speak and and can reach people with passion and conviction not just somebody who's up there talking but somebody who's up there feeling you know was you know was we did i did an interview earlier today and our documentary is um in the runnings for an emmy now oh. and so they're doing all these interviews right, right. and now my emotions are here so mm -hmm. you know what they want to talk about in the interviews they want to talk about you know what's going on right which is right and i told him i said i wish i wish i didn't have this ability to speak and captivate folks because this ability and this talent came from 35 years of hurt came from 35 years of trauma came from compressing the gunshot wounds of young people that I've mentored and I've never been to medical school. Came from my brother dying at nine years old and I was six. Came from being going over 200 funerals and, and watching the news and watching in my communities as this force who was supposed to be put in place to protect us, to protect and serve, whatever you want to call it. And people die and we are dying and nothing's being done about it. Like it comes at a heavy cost. And when they say heavy is the, the head that wears the crown, it's, it's I, never, I never understood any of that. I never understood those type of sayings because it was like, I didn't see, I didn't see that part. That wasn't a thing for me. Um, and now I understand, but now that I do have the voice and now that I know I have the power to captivate people, there's no shutting me up. There's no silence in me. Like, you're going to have to kill me. <laughs> that's, that's the only way to shut me up. And, when, and if something happened to me, they ain't going to have to worry about nothing. You ain't got to worry about no peaceful protests. You don't have to worry about no, no silent marches in the street. Folks going to go. And so it's, you know, while I have this voice and while I have this breath in my body, I have to make sure every interview that I do, every time I speak, every time I open my mouth, I don't care if I'm at the grocery store or I'm the keynote speaker at a college where it's 10,000 people in the crowd. I have to make sure I am delivering the same message, the same passion, the same empowerment, but more importantly, the same truth. I feel it. And that's what... That's what everyone needs to hear is is the truth that you have. I think I think a lot of times when people like you speak, it doesn't get pushed out enough. There's not enough people making sure that your yeah. videos reach others, that your what you are saying reaches out. And we've all got to be look. We've got social media where we can share unlimited, and we got to do that. We got to do talk. that. When someone has a voice, we got to we got to let everybody know, "Hey, this person's willing to speak. You might you might feel you can't speak or you might be afraid or or you might feel like you're not worth being up there to speak. Then get beside, behind somebody who, who is, is speaking and Facts. share and let Facts. people know this person is this person's telling it. They're they're talking. They're People are listening. Share them, you know. Tweet that Absolutely. shit out. <laughs> Retweet it. Real talk. I like it. I mean, we have Real all these talk. powerful tools, and and people aren't so using them enough. So few people use them. It's easy to retweet all the bad things, but how about we start saying, "Hey, let's let's retweet the voices that have something to Just say." That. Yeah. No, I, I wholeheartedly agree. I and realistically, be you know, before we go any further. Um, I had a battle versus B died. It was a really good battle. Mm -hmm. And 
um, in my third round, I talked to uh, Gully, who was my brother. Um, who, he always had my back through with KLTD, him and Organic. And he just had a son. He's a white, he's a white dude. He just had a son. And I talked about in that battle how you have to have a different conversation with your son. But I, I told him, I gave him some um, advice. I said, you, you know, if your if your if your son sees his black friends in trouble, use his white privilege as a superpower. Yes. Right. And that's that's kind of what you guys are doing right now. You guys have a platform. You could talk to anybody. You can find anybody on the street. You can find anybody in in. You know, you guys have a you have you have a platform, whether it's two people, two thousand, twenty thousand, or two hundred thousand. You guys have a platform that you are utilizing in order to make sure truth is heard. And it's not even that I'm commending you for it, I'm thanking you for it because if we had more white folks, if we had more non-black people that were willing to take their 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 platforms and uplift these voices and take a step back and say, you know what? Hey, it's time to listen if y'all ain't never listened before. That's what's important right now. That's what we need right now because the more and more that happens, the more and more we get into different homes, we get into different spaces, we get into more places where people may be uncomfortable, but they have to understand that change is uncomfortable, but it's inevitable. And that's, this is how we are going to push it uh, by, by folks understanding how big their platforms is and opening their platforms and uplifting the voices of, of the most vulnerable and the forgotten about. Um, so I, I appreciate you guys. I just wanted to say that before Thank we you. You know, went any further. Thank you. Thank you. We... You know, there's, there's a lot of, a, a lot of white folks that are, they, they know what's right, but they're scared to speak on what's right because they don't want to be judged. Mm -hmm. And I think that that needs to be thrown out the fucking window. If you know oh, something's no. right, you need to speak on it. You need to spread the message. You need to, you need to fight for what's right. And we it, have it, to be there's the just change. too many. There's too many that just don't because they're afraid of being judged or, or they're afraid of of uh being criticized i don't give, Luka, i don't give okay. i don't give a fuck what anybody thinks about me <laughs> what i right. believe is what i believe <laughs> and un unfortunately unfortunately that's that's not the majority thought process when it comes to to white folks you know that and I, 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 I go back to Martin Luther King's speech, um, you know, his, no, not his speech, his letter, letter from a Birmingham jail. And, you know, to paraphrase, he talked about, and this is something that I've said, it's a reason why I was, why I was able to work with Republicans, with white Republicans, and had issue with white Democrats, although I'm a Democrat. It's because I knew where they were at. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to wonder where they were at. I knew what we agreed on. I knew what we disagreed on. If they didn't like me, they made sure they told me and I made sure I told them motherfuckers back. <laughs> but when it came to something that we can work together on for both our communities, we put all that to the side and work, move forward and then start fighting again once we were done. Right. It's the folks that you don't, that, that hide in plain sight. Yes. It's those who, who, who may have a Black Lives Matter yard sign in their yard, um, who who owns that business, who who has that that those couple black friends that they went to college with, but don't have any black employees. Right. That that won't that won't promote those those two black employees that they have, or that still get scared and clutch their purse when I walk past them because I have tattoos on my face, not knowing that I'm probably more accomplished than you. My car that I'm going to get in is probably nicer than yours. My house is probably bigger than yours. Those are the folks that I worry about. The ones that hide in plain sight that that we can drive by and, and see see the see the, the 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 dog and pony show, but we never get to see them in the field or them speaking the truth. And that's where it starts. Mm -hmm. 
that's where it starts. It starts with them speaking up and going into their communities and their neighborhoods and standing on it and being unapologetic in your stance for Black lives. See, it's two things that need to happen. Us as Black folks, we got to be unapologetically Black every day. Every day that we wake up, every every when we go to sleep and everything in between, we have to be unapologetically Black. And those who consider themselves allies, and I don't like to say allies, I like to say my, my European family, my white family, those who consider themselves family that don't look like me, they have to be unapologetic in their stances for Black Absolutely. lives. That means not only talk about it, be about it. If you see me in the street, and something's happening to me, don't pull out your camera. I need you to throw your body in a way because that's what I would do. If I saw both of y'all just on the side of the street and the police was harassing y'all and grabbed both of y'all up, well, he gonna have to grab me up too because I can't see that happen with my own eyes. We need more of that. Yes. We have to be willing to stand beside and in front of each other as necessary. Absolutely. You absolutely. Couldn't have said it better myself. It is. And... There's there's a lot of other issues we got to get to someday where that's going to come back yeah, and ben, I'm going to talk about that. <laughs> I, I think I spent uh, a good hour and a half, probably about a year ago, talking about people pulling out their fucking cell phones instead of helping a motherfucker out. Yeah. Man, that, and that's in so much. That is in so many things. It's not even just in this. There is just way too much of that. Action. It's such a, it's such a hard balance because... If they don't pull out, if you don't pull out your phone, right, we don't get that footage, right? But fuck that. If the police got their knee on my neck, don't pull out no phone. Fuck them up. Because that's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to do, y'all. We, ha we have like, to stop it. Yeah. I, 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 and, I, and, and please, I don't want anybody to take this as me ridiculing those who have caught footage because we thank you for that. I'm just telling you where my, my mindset is. I've seen so much and been through so much and not once have I ever thought to pull out my phone. It was always me reacting. We were just at a protest here in Phoenix and the police officer hopped out the car on one of our, you know, on one of our white um, organizers and threatened them. Like, if you do it, and I didn't, without thinking, I ran to the front. You ain't gonna do shit, get back in the car. <laughs> Cause you gonna have to deal with all of us. Is that what you want? You gonna have to deal with all of us. So if you're willing to deal with all of us, go ahead and put your hands on them. Because if you put your hands on them, we're going to make you earn your paycheck. And he got in the car and he drove off. Now, later on, when they caught my brother by himself, they locked him up and we had to go to the jail. But they, but they knew where we stood. Yeah. Yeah. They knew what we were about. You know, so, you know, it's not, not knocking anybody uh, for crap grabbing that footage and getting that evidence because we wholeheartedly appreciate you. I just, I, I just can't do it. I can't do it. I gotta, I'm going down with you. Take one, take all, touch one, touch all. That's just how. Well, I'll and that, move. that's how it's gotta be. It's, it's gotta that's be. That's the only, that's the only way that this is going to, to change anything. That's the only way change is going to happen is everybody has to fight. Everybody has to take a fall. Or everybody has to be lifted up it's Period. it's and you know there's people sitting around been doing too nothing. much silence and not saying anything you might as well be on the other, other side. you might as well be on the other side if you ain't doing shit something if you believe it speak on it i can't i can't even we say it every day it is if you're not talking about it then you're part <laughs> of the problem Yes. It was Lupe. It was Lupe Fiasco that said, "I think that all the silence is worse than all the violence. Fear is such a weak emotion. That's why I despise it." Yes. It's uh, yeah. Silence is compliance. Yes. And that's what happened to Germany. Silence was compliance. Facts. I wholeheartedly agree. It. It's just. There's been so much silence, and, you know, we talk about how hard it is. We know you work day to day. You're, work, you're living paycheck to paycheck. You're tired when you get home. You barely have time to see your kids if you got kids and everything. But, you know, sometimes we just got to pull that up and go, look, it, you know, I'm tired, but everybody else is too. We got to do this. Do it anyway. And just do it. I can tell you're tired right now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you know what? It's I'm I'm 
And I just said, you know what? That's funny you said that the guy who was interviewing us from uh, from um, IndieWire, he said, uh, he asked me how I felt. He's like getting a temperature check. I said, I'm tired. Physically, I feel great. Mentally, I'm, a, I'm as okay as I could possibly be. But my soul is tired. When I look at you, I see that. I can I see do. that. I don't need to ask. And I think, I think there's a great many people in this world who, who feel that very much and understand what you're saying. And all this has just been dragging and dragging on it. And the media, the media, the media don't even get me started on the media. The media does not help. A the lot. media covers the story that until something else is going to cover up that story. And yeah. right now, it's COVID-19 coming back. You're hearing less about the movement and you're hearing more about fucking virus. That's a problem. I don't know how to alleviate that problem. I don't know how to get Black Lives Matter back into the media. The you, public you know media, what, <laughs> I guess to say. You know when it's gonna get back into the media? When, a, when, when another build, person when dies. More builders, yeah, when another person dies or when more buildings start burning. They love to talk about burning buildings. They love to talk about burning. Yeah. Burning, they do. Burning they, want, they want those it's, big, bright headlines that yeah. sell that sell shit. That make them money, because that's all they give a fuck about, really, is money. And now, and, COVID-19, I'm not a, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I, I, I know it's real. I've actually lost a couple family members to it. But on the same hand, not even but, moreover, I feel like now they didn't expect things to go the way they went when you had Amar Arbery then, uh, Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and uh, Deion Johnson here in, in, who was killed while sleeping in his car. Um, and, and, and Rashard, um, Rashard down in Atlanta. Like they wasn't expecting this, right? Mm -mm. And so now what happens in the media, what now what happens with the politicians? It was, everybody was Black Lives Matter for a minute. Everybody had woken up and was apologizing for racism and the systemic issues. And we got to do better and we got to police reform and and then shit hit the fan. And now it's all oh, COVID-19 and it's a, another outbreak coming and so on and so forth. But why can't we do both? We can, we can. Right? Yeah, we absolutely can, right? It's the same like, process. Viruses are always going to be there. We can't stop our lives for every virus that comes along. Yes, this one has some very extreme things that make a difference, but something as simple as a mask can make a big difference. When you don't know you're carrying it and you're going out there mm -hmm. spreading it, if you've got a mask on, you're less likely to get someone else sick. That's it. Simple. Yeah, it's not, the mask is not to protect you. It's to protect other people from you. And every day you go out and put that on, just think, I could have it, and I don't want nobody else to get it, and then keep going Yeah, forward. that's that's the problem, Mr. Buttersworth, is is the general population, they, they, mm -hmm. they lose attention to what matters. Everything's 30-second bit. And ain't not one mask gonna save us from dying. Nope. No. You can have on a mask, and, and I, know, I know several black people that... Are terrified to go out at all because they're afraid if they're wearing a mask something's yeah, gonna we've happen seen the, we've seen the videos we've seen how do you how during a how is it during a pandemic you put a black man out of a walmart for wearing a mask i don't even know i, I walk in stores with my mask on and i can't lie to y'all i i be wishing that something like that happened to me. I'm gonna make these motherfuckers so famous. <laughs> like, I'm gonna give you all the attention you want, need, and deserve. Yes. If you approach me on this bullshit. It's so weird to me to see folks walking around with these masks on and they and even they have the red and blue ones that that we wore as gang members, right? Mm -hmm. Now it's now it's keeping you alive. Mm -hmm. When you don't understand, that's what was keeping us alive in the community. But you didn't understand that. Right. 
that was that what was keeping us safe in the community wearing this particular color rag around my mouth but now it's an issue when we did it in the streets and while we was getting tear gas and pepper spray many people came and saw those pictures and said well why are they covering their face up well i guess you never got pepper spray or tear gas mm -hmm. and now we covering our face everywhere we go you can't sit down at the casino without a mask on and a glass shield feeling like you work in the same place as homer simpson and that's the that's the most secure fucking place there is there's a camera everywhere in that right <laughs> facts so um cloud i have friends in tulsa giving me constant updates since yesterday or the day before there is so much tension in tulsa mm -hmm. please pray for those people send good vibes whatever it is you believe in tulsa needs whatever it. god it you pray to powder keg my uh, my my uh my my man my good brother uh joshua harris teal he is a descendant of emmett teal um he is also the uh president of young democrats of america young black brother mm -hmm. and he is in oklahoma and he's in tulsa right now he i know he lives in okc but he's in Tulsa right now. And he's from Oklahoma, has always been Oklahoma. Um, and I'm tapping in with him because it ain't nothing. It's a that's an hour and a half flight for me. Yeah. So they the the system, they better keep cool because we on we on deck for that. That's been something for that should have happened a long time ago as far as organizing in Tulsa and really getting to you and know it, what they what what they did to us back in the day. You know, a lot of people don't know about Tulsa. And yeah, Black I grew Wall up Street. I grew I grew up in Oklahoma. So it was you know, you learn Oklahoma history in school, right? It's like a paragraph. It wow. gets a paragraph. Wow. My best friend moved to Dell City, Oklahoma. And it was the first place I ever traveled to on an airplane. First plane ride I ever went to was uh, to OKC. And then we went to uh, Dell City. And I remember learning very early, but it never hitting me, right? It never really resonated because I wasn't in that mindset. Right. Even as I got older. And then I remember it was one time in 2015 and I was just watching YouTube and I was watching a bunch of videos where people were talking and then they had old videos with folks who were um, the children and, you know, family members of, of some folks involved, you know, some of the tragedies. And I remember sitting there just crying full blown tears, like, what the fuck are we supposed to do? Like, we talk about regenerating the black dollar and making sure that we have our own businesses and making sure that our communities are flourishing by supporting each other. Um, and look what happens, look what they do to flourishing black folks. It's, it's, it's bad enough y'all killing us, period. But I mean, <laughs> that's, it, it's hard. It it's is. hard. My, yeah, my, my, my prayers and vibes and everything else are with everybody in, in Tulsa. And if if I get the phone call, if they tap me on my shoulder, I got flight money right here just waiting. So. Well, I have, I hope, but I don't know. It, my, my friends say that, and they live there day to day, and they said the, the tension in the air you feel it is you just feel it overwhelming in the entire city and they and many of these people that i know will be going out in protest and everything and so i'm very concerned um creel good, That's question. A good question uh what would be your approach to defund the police <coughs> and judicial system Oh, so let's talk about the defunding of the police. Um, first, when the first thing I would do is um, in St. Louis, what we did, we did an audit of the police department. 
And within that audit, we found that they have frivolously spent $7 million on overtime, right? It starts there. Well, now that $7 million y'all don't have anymore. Right. What other equipment, what, what hundreds of thousands of million dollars have you spent on equipment that you haven't had to use? Right. If you look at Riot Gear, if you look at um, a lot of the tactical toys that they have um, that they don't use to protect people Not that look like them, right? Um, they only use to protect buildings when a black man or a black woman dies and we take to the streets and in initially nonviolent protest. Um, so you, you begin to audit, basically audit the police department, understand where the money, so you gotta break down the police budget, right? How much goes into everything? What, what can we start cutting out, right? right. What, what are the things that we can take away? Um, once you take that money away though, it's not just about taking that money away. What do you do with that money? You take some place like St. Louis, who spends over 56% of their budget on public safety, but spends less than 15% on social services, Damn. on services for the most crime-ridden, most economically distressed communities. So when you take that 6 million, when you take that 7 million, when you take that 30 million, depending on how big your city is and what that budget is, and you reallocate that into the communities where it's most needed, you will see a dramatic drop in crime. You will see a dramatic drop in crime from top to bottom, right? Once you see that dramatic drop in crime, we start dropping in crime. What do you need police for? Right. Why do you need so many police? Right? Why, why is St. Louis Police Department um, ran by the city? Um, it has local control, but every other police department in the state is under state control. What department is killing the most black folks? What department has the most complaints? What department has the most lawsuits? What department, they're killing their own officers. We have a black officer who was shot by a white officer while the black officer was in front of his home off duty. We have a black officer who was beaten by white officers while he was undercover. So 56% of the budget don't make sense for y'all right now. No. So once you start taking money from the police department, you make sure you reallocate those funds so that we can address crime from the root cause and on the front end by bettering our schools, by making sure there are more job opportunities, by making sure we have equal access to health care, including our undiagnosed mental health issues. That will make a dramatic drop right, in crime. You start trickling down a police department, eventually you don't need them. We have places that have a police department, that have a sheriff's department, and has a highway patrol. Mm -hmm. If that's not over enforcement, I don't know what the hell is. And once that crime is dropping in our communities, once we can, we can get to a, a place where we are community policing, but we are community policing. We are neighborhood watching. We are keeping our community safe because we have that ability. The Black Panthers was were, were the most, I'm talking about, you talk about a, a when since people want to talk about the second amendment, you want to talk about a well-regulated militia? Mm -hmm. Black right. Panthers was a was the the only well regu regulated militia I've seen when it comes to uh, lock and step in uniform, understanding the power that they have, right, in in empowering their communities and better bettering our communities because it wasn't just about a bunch of black folks dressed in black with afros holding assault rifles and, and long guns. It was about the breakfast programs, it was about the education programs, it was about them putting their own newspaper out so folks can understand exactly what the system was doing and attempting to do to them. It was about them standing for black lives no matter what at all costs. Right. And had it not been for the system, had it not been for law enforcement, the only people they ever beef with was law enforcement. They, they weren't beefing with other black folks in the community because they was keeping the community safe. They were beefing with law enforcement because they took that power away from law enforcement and law enforcement wasn't looked at as, as, as the safekeepers in our communities, as the peacekeepers in our community. So I, this idea of defunding the police is so big and I think people need to understand how important it is to defund the police and start to allocate those funds into 
front end programs so that we can eventually abolish the police because they're, that's just what needs to happen. Police, people keep talking about police reform. What, 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 what more do we need to reform? We talked about police reform and civil rights movement. We talked about police reform um, after, after Stonewall. We talked about police reform after Rodney King. We talked about police reform after Trayvon. We talked about police reform after, after Michael Brown, after Eric Garner, after all of these folks. And now we're in 2020 still talking about police reform. We're past that. We yeah, we're, yeah, we're past that. Did, yeah, this is a, well, now, yeah. now it's time to, in order to rebuild, you gotta destroy it. The, so how do you I'm decrease how do you decrease police, police union's power? Oh will the defunding that, so, do that? So defunding will do that for one, will help do that. Okay. But the other way to decrease uh, police union's power is by understanding how the police unions work and understanding how those contracts work. Who are those contracts with? Who signs those contracts? What political power? Because cities are made up. Um, different ways. Some 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 places mayors have a lot of power. Some places city managers have the most power. Mm -hmm. You understand what that structure looks like first. Who's in charge of the police department? Is the police department uh, locally ran? Is it state ran? Um, who has the say? So is there a public safety director? Right, like St. Louis. St. Louis so has a public really safety director. So we really have to look at our right. local communities and really you understand. Have to, okay. You okay. have to look at the local communities to understand how the police department is built, who 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 benefits from these relationships. Right. Because what you might have to do is start attacking and getting at the folks who benefit from the relationship first. Therefore, they will have no more. Uh, they will have no more political capital to push forward okay. to to further in these relationships. Phoenix, to answer your question, you defund the police, you reallocate that money to, to civil community. services. To help the community. Crime will decrease. You won't need the police. Look, what we need with police, what? We need some detectives to, uh, you know, solve crimes that do happen. We don't need police on the streets constantly fucking, fucking with people. No, but you do need the detectives to help when there is a crime. I mean, let's be real. Social uh, serial killers aren't going anywhere. We need people that take care of that shit. You know, stuff like that. The, yeah, them's the crazy stuff. white folks. That stuff oh. needs to be, you know, what but, our police yeah. departments are doing. But the sad thing about it is, Tamir Rice can get shot at twelve in a park playing with a twelve gun in less than five seconds. But Dylan Roof gets Burger King before he goes to jail after killing black folks in a church. Right, like we do, we don't. It's it, it's it's even a step further beyond because if you have a prosecutor, if you have a prosecutor that has investigators, then I don't need the police detectives as well. Okay, I need the prosecutor and her investigators to find out what happened to in the death of my brother. And but right? we need DAs that are good. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. There is just how as about much DAs problem? that. That, that, first of all, want to be the DA, I, I guess, I guess. Do, I well, to? no, no, no. What we need is DAs that um, aren't on the good old boy network. True. Yeah. Yeah. We need DAs yeah. that um, aren't out for how many things they, you know, how many cases they win, that it becomes about justice and not winning a case. We need DAs that understand that we can't lock our way up out of this problem. Exactly. We need DAs that are going to create reentry programs and help mm -hmm. reentry programs and concentrate more on making sure that those nonviolent offenders um, and those offenders, period, um, right. who might not have a record, right? Who might not understand that it's case by case scenario and also understanding that you know what we can deal in right and wrong all we want we know what the books say we know what the laws say but at the end of the day if we are not dealing in reality we are going to continue this mass incarceration because you got to look at the reality of somebody's upbringing you got to yes. look at the reality of what the situation that they were in and not saying we need to take it too lightly or just give them a slap on the wrist and say hey 
go ahead about your day. No, we need to be able to offer some some real resources for folks. Yes. Right. We need to offer some real resources for folks so they can better their life and so they can be in a in a position to become upstanding citizen um, in their particular community. But we we did that. We did that. We went and got Wesley Bell. Like we got Wesley Bell in office. We got Kim Gardner in office. Kim Gardner is basically telling the police right now, listen, check this out. I don't trust y'all. I don't trust these warrants that y'all bringing us. I know you free case people all the time. I know you been in this many police involved shootings and I have evidence of this, 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 and this, and I can't trust your warrant. So I won't even, I'm, I'm not even moving on anything yes. that you got to say. Yes. And they are attacking her right now. They are fighting her. They're trying to get her out of office. Her, her. her race is in August. And the police unions are attacking her. The police are attacking her. All these folks are. And me and her haven't always agreed. That's, that's, that's a given, right? We haven't always agreed. But at the end of the day, this Black woman in this power, the most powerful law enforcement in the city of St. Louis is being attacked by other law enforcement and other status quo holders because of her pushback on these particular officers and her pushback on the system. Yeah, Same way with Wesley Bell. Yep. And they need to be called out. They do. Um, it's absolutely, uh, yeah, we need DAs that don't care about leveling up in elections. Uh, we need judges that, we need people to understand when they elect judges who those judges are and what they are and those what they're about. We, ne we need to stop uh, uh, absentee ballots that have been cast in incorrectly which is exactly what happened with you in 2016. I mean, yeah. there's so what, much. What the, like, so, had and, you and not called thing, for a recount? Yeah, and, and, but, and this is my thing. The, the, that was such a, that was such a historic, but hard. Um, I mean, it's a hard fight because you look at how they have suppressed our vote. You look at how they have tried to strip the, actually stripped and watered down the Voting Rights Act. And so when it comes to us having access to the ballot box, like we need all the access that we can get, Yes. right? The problem is the actual politicians, the politicians that take advantage of a community mm -hmm. that isn't as educated civically about um, absentee voting, and it seems right to them because they don't know any better, right? Mm -hmm. And this, this politician takes advantage of these folks and now they've been stealing these elections and you finally get the black rapper with tattoos on his face that say, y'all got me fucked up. I'm you from the hood. That shit. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and what was so wild end. about it was they couldn't even recount it. They had to throw every single vote out. Right, give yeah. us a whole new election on a Friday in a Wizard of Oz storm, and people still came out to vote, and it spoke to a testament of what our message was and who we were in the community. But then it's like I have a court case against another black candidate. Now I know white candidates who been embezzling money, who then did all mm -hmm. of these horrible things, right? And they ain't getting not, not held accountable once. But now you got two black folks against each other in court. And I ain't gonna lie. I was like, you know what? I don't want them to go to jail. The, mm -hmm. You know what the justice is? The justice is me winning this race. I ain't, I ain't putting no more black folks in jail, especially when I see white folks doing the same thing or even worse and and Nobody's not getting out. held accountable yeah. for Nobody's it. No, I ain't put, they just I ain't put no more black people under the in jail. Yeah, call it, call it right, wrong, or indifferent. I ain't put no more black people in jail. If, if I can't get the same, if you can't keep that same energy for these white elected officials, right? I don't care what kind of beef me and my opponent had or me and their family had. No, nah, I ain't no, no, nah, we're not, we not doing that. So be mad at me. You know, they, I didn't give two shits. We no, I understand completely the sentiment behind that, and and I have a big problem. Phoenix, 
Having grown up in Ada, Oklahoma, I have a big problem with the judicial system. <laughs> so, <laughs> Phoenix, you and I have had these conversations before. Creating laws or adding amendments doesn't fucking do anything. We had the same argument on gun laws. All that you can create all the fucking gun laws you want. I'm still gonna be able to get a gun. It's, you're it's, you're it's, only talking about after the fact things. Oh, it already <sighs> happened, and then we can refer to this law. And that doesn't that's solve any problems. Reinvesting in the communities that need it. I was a lawmaker. Like, I've been on that side. <laughs> I was a lawmaker. Like. Wait, what is this, Creole? Outside the police and judges, how would you handle the welfare system? Project housing and education, passing students without educating them. So we have a yes. massive, we have two really massive crises in this country that, that nobody's talking about. We have an education crisis and we have a mental health crisis. Okay, so let's, education. If you look at our educational system, I mean, I say the system for a reason. Mm -hmm. They're not, they're not, they're not stripping resources out of black communities on accident. They're not stripping educational resources out of, out of black communities on accident. They're not creating this system of, of charter schools that cherry pick the best of the best in our black communities and leave our, our community schools um, with less population and lower scores, which makes those schools close and it forces other children to have to either migrate to different schools or do what do what we have seen, dropping out, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Like, and so this this system isn't doing any of this these things by accident. You talk about public housing. Public housing was created in our communities to contain crime. We talk about welfare. Hey, my mom was on welfare. My mom, the greatest woman to walk the face of this earth, and I'll fight anybody that got, got, got anything to say about it. But she was on welfare because she had to be. Yes. That's, that's what had to happen. But when you create this, this system of making people dependent, then there can't be this abrupt stop to that system. No. And you can't you can't do anything about that system until you start replacing the resources that 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 they stripped out of the communities or never put in those communities on purpose. So before we can talk about public housing, before we can talk about the welfare system, we have to talk about the stripping of the resources. Once we put those 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 resources back into the community, once we stop um funding our schools or finding a different funding mechanism for our public schools other than property value because if 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 i live in a poor community and our property value is shit and you in just a, a a mile and a half away you got big big fortune 500 companies who for one aren't going to hire from within my community for two don't give a damn about my community and then you give them a 10-year tax abatement they ain't even paying a property tax, a little bit of property tax they do have to pay. So none of that money is going back into the schools. And so now our schools in the most, most economically distressed communities are run down or aren't present, right? So until we find a different funding mechanism to fund our school that's going to adhere to, you, you go, to, go, go out to a, urban, a suburban area where you talk about a, a, it may be a public school, but it is a flourishing public school. Like I went to, I went to Lindbergh High School, one of the best schools in America, and it's a public school, but it was in a place where you had a median income of mm -hmm. maybe over $100,000. Mm -hmm. And so what happens when you take the same funding mechanisms for every school, every school in the state, and you put all that money in the same pot? And everybody's getting the same education, no matter what your zip code is, no matter what the color of your skin is, no matter what your, your parents' educational level is. Everybody's now getting that same education. Now what? So there are a lot of things we need to talk about before we can, we can address this, 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 what people see as a problem in, in welfare and, and uh, public housing. And 
for any of you who I, are thinking this doesn't affect <coughs> me, let me tell you. Poor farming communities, same problem. Same thing. Native, like especially res schools, same problem. Absolutely. Now that, that this I is not, you know, I, I want everybody to be clear. This is affecting us as a whole. It's more white folks on welfare than black folks. That's true. Yes. I mean, there's it's more, more white folks, more white that folks in America now. too. But, yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. But there's this, there's this, there's this illusion that there are more black folks on welfare. Percentage yeah, wise, not, there is not. not. Right. Percentage wise, yeah, there is it, not. It's, no, I mean, it's just not right. Uh, it's that reverse argument now that we were talking about with <laughs> with, with the gun deaths, you know, with the deaths by right, police officers. Exactly. It's, it's, it's we say, oh, there are just as many white folks now at the hands of the police as black. And we say, OK, yeah, we're only 17 percent. And now we say, oh, well, black folks on welfare. Nah, we are. But it's more, y'all, yep. welfare. Yeah. Than, you know, that's so true. it's that same thing. Um, yeah, have... but that's not a we, we got a We got a keen problem with. Um, you know, we have an issue with coming up with great solutions for problems that we don't have or don't need to be addressing at this moment, right? Skipping over what we need to hit on the head to disperse right. all of this rather there than is, there is no keep putting one... band-aids on gunshot wounds. Yeah, there is no one answer for all this. There is a massive amount of change to make everything be what it needs to be. But the very first step where we are today is very much, we've got to get these policemen under control. They work for us, for starters. Not the other way around. They're supposed to. Do you know to. most police don't even know the laws of the, uh, that they're they don't, enforcing? Yeah, they don't even know their own fucking laws. Oh, I absolutely, man. I, <laughs> listen, I am the wrong person to any police that may come across this video. <laughs> I am the wrong person to pull over without knowing your shit. I'm the wrong person to approach without just without knowing your shit because I help write these laws. I help fight these laws. I kill bad bills, right? That could have been detrimental to, to black and brown communities. Like, so I like, and that's why I try to educate my young people that I mentor so much. Uh, so that they can know the law as well. They can know what they can and can't do and stand firmly in that. Yes. Um, but you are absolutely right. A lot of these police do not know. I had a police officer tell us at a protest, you can't videotape me. I said, show me where it says that she can't video, because I ain't gonna videotape. I, 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 wanna, I wanna have a different interaction with you. I'll let her do the videotaping, but you show me the ordinance, the law, or the policy that says that she can't videotape you and I'll take her phone for you. I watched a, uh, a video on Twitter not that long ago and uh, there was a guy standing outside of a police station with his phone recording. It was and one it of was the, like, it was one of the battle rappers. Five, six, who was that? I can't remember. It five, was... six, seven, seven cops showed up and they were like, yeah, you can't be here recording. He's like, it's public property. I can do whatever I want. I can record. I can There's right no law here. that says I can't record. Nope. And they were, oh yeah. <laughs> Only one just new watched, law. Just one cop out of all of them. Just watched a video. Law, right? Just watched a video with that exact same thing. Yeah, it was show off. That's who it was. Yep. You know, and the more we stand up and say, yo, we know our laws. Because we all got to learn it. Guys, if you don't know, you need to learn. You got to know. Our youngest and daughter look. is taking criminal justice in high school because I told her, look, you got to know. And she was like, I think this will help me in my whole life? I because said, yes. they will lie to you. They'll cheat to get what they want out of you. They and they're will, allowed they will, to. They will push you to the point, even if you're not guilty, they will push you to the point to where you just give up. And say whatever. You know how many, you know how many people in jail that didn't do it? Yep. <laughs> yes. I, I, I try to tell people, I try to tell my white folks that I come in contact with, conservative folks that I would argue with on the floor, I say, I don't know if y'all ever had any run-ins or had any family members there, run-ins with the police that were poor, that come from a community where the police have targeted them, that come from mm -hmm. a community where police stats, um, the more guns and drugs they get, the better they are and the more they move up. So they're going to get guns and drugs regardless whether yes. you have drugs or guns or not. So I don't know if y'all you know, I told him, I don't know if y'all come from that, 
But think about somebody poor who doesn't have the money to get a lawyer, who has to rely on a public defender and nothing against the public defenders, but they are overworked, overwhelmed and underpaid, right? So you have a public defender that has this caseload as, as tall as them if they stood on their shoulders three times. And what do you expect this person who might not have the education, who might not understand exactly what they read and are signing and saying, hey, you know what? And somebody comes and scares the shit out of them and say, look, you're going to lose this case. If you lose this case, you're going to do 30 years to life. You're going to do 20 years to life. You can, you can just cop out right now and take seven years. You can take five years. You'll be out in three and a half. Boom. Oh, well, I'll I know, take that. I yeah. know people who've been on death row who were innocent. I'm oh, all yeah. about Project Innocence. Ada, mm -hmm. Oklahoma had one of the Bro. most corrupt police departments, I swear to God, in the 80s. They, there is still a man in prison to this day, and his co-defendant got out. That's man. how bad it is. Man. The man, is, it's been, it was 1986, maybe, when he got put in jail. I can't quite remember. It was and on top of that, whenever somebody does wind up being found innocent they'll force you to sign some shit not found innocent no when there's enough like the west memphis three when those three guys one of them was on death row two of them in prison there was enough public outcry that they were like okay we'll let them go but you had to sign this well, those were kids though yeah they they were kids yeah. when they went in that you yeah, have to they, sign they this. made them you can't sign sue us. that you can't sue you can't in sue order us. to get out and you're still a convicted murderer yeah, you keep the yeah. charge. We're gonna they let make you, you out. Sign it. But you can't yeah, make you sign A lot of NDA. times they do. Yeah. The, that's that's one of the biggest issues, and that I had an issue with, and I actually, uh, I wanted to get rid of NDAs, right? Non disclosure agreements. Yep. Because that's used that's used to silence people. It is. Um, and I never I never understood it until I was put in a position. I was put in a position. Um. And after that, I said, you know what? If this ever comes up, they're just gonna have to sue me. Right. Because you just you just never know until you're in those positions. And what something you said, um, when you say folks gotta educate themselves, I would implore those who are educated to take the extra step and be patient with people who don't aren't educated right in this help process and, and help, and help them be. because you can't nobody can come to me and say hey here go here go the tools to build a house i need you to build a house tomorrow i don't know the first thing about building a house i don't even know where to go to learn how to build a house right now i haven't been taught that right mm -hmm. now you give me some other things i could throw a bowling ball i could rap i could i could write poems i could do a whole lot of stuff building a house ain't one of them and so when we talk about that education that folks need um those of us who are educated people ask me all the time why do you talk you know why do you talk to people like why do you take all this time out to i said because my grandma said you might be the only bible that somebody reads yes they might not never pick up a bible to read any of the scriptures in there right but I know a few of those stories and I could put it away that's not going to turn them off. That's not going to put them in a box or make them feel like they're uneducated about this. I can, I can relate that to a whole battle rap situation. I can relate that to a sports situation. I can use parables to show you exactly the message that they was trying to get out and not even use where art thou or nothing else. Right, so it's gonna take us to educate in the best way that we know how and meeting people where they at because that's one of the issues with us woke folks, white and black, right? We 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 so woke that we sleep. We so woke that we alienate people yes. and we put people in corners and, and, and chastise them for being new to the party or new to the fight. My Uncle Max said, don't be in such a hurry to condemn those who don't do as you do or think as you think, because there once was a time when you didn't do as you do or think as you think today. So, you know, so it's, a, it's okay if you're late to the party, you heard? Yeah, as long as you're there. Um, Creole, I like that question. Um, I've seen some of these programs like requiring people on certain types of welfare to attain, go to school, obtain a degree or something. 
I've seen some be very successful, but at the same time, we're looking at millennials that are coming out of college and with degrees, some of them master's degrees in multiple subjects, and these kids can't get a job. So I don't know that saying, hey, go to school is the answer. I, I, I think maybe no, yeah. we should be talking about programs where people learn how to do stuff that they could jump right into a job. A trade, maybe? You know, and yeah. not everybody's yeah. cut out to be behind a desk. We got one kid that absolutely will never be behind a desk. Yeah, my oldest son, he ain't, he ain't ever going to be in an office. But the problem is we don't have trade schools that people can go to mm -hmm. that they can afford. Half the trade schools out there don't take public you, uh, government funding. And then the other half, they're, you still have X amount of dollars on top of what FAFSA will pick up. And so that's, yeah. that's a problem. When you can't, when these, my niece, just, somebody just finished paying off. She was very close to paying off her college loans. She's in her, she's in her late 20s. And somebody angeled her the rest of her school loan and she was just crying with happiness and you know if we're at that point <laughs> yeah. that we're crying we'll that tears because that burden is off of our young people we got a problem yeah and and to speak to and to speak to like we killed we killed a bill um, a couple times when I was in office, a work requirement bill, you, you're telling somebody who's on welfare in Missouri. Where there's not very many jobs, especially out in the outer reaches. And that don't make a livable wage no. where minimum wage is $9, right? You're telling somebody who might not have the education to go out here and get a job. You're telling them to go be part of a program for two, four, six months where they're not getting paid to be in this program and pass this program and still don't have a, a, a for sure nailed in job. You're telling them to take six months off of life and go do these things in order to advance and then they still might not be able to work. But at the end of it, because they have completed their work requirement, they might be off of welfare. Yes. So they're not getting that assistance anymore and they ain't got no yeah, job. They're, they're telling people, you gotta do all the shit, you've gotta work to not get the income that you've been relying on and you still not be able to find a job. If if I if I have to if I have to do these things to survive, right? Stay on welfare, do these things to survive, or work, make barely just enough to survive, but still don't now I have to pay for food. Now I have to pay for all of these things out of pocket with cash. I'm not getting food stamps anymore. I'm not getting this type of assistance anymore. I'm I'm poorer now with the job than I was on welfare. Yes. Yeah, not the work requirements and education requirements are problematic. Empowering to do so, absolutely. Creating the programs to 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 make it. That right before I left, I was on the verge. I was working with Columbia College. Um, I I was working with Columbia College um, and the Cardinals and the St. Louis Cardinals, and we almost created a free twenty four hour online college from my district oh. where every semester I was going to put I was going to be able to put 30 adults whether they were young adults or working parents or whoever that was right at the poverty line right above the poverty line or below the poverty line put them in college for free 30 per semester for four years that was the initial you know that was our initial kick in I was I was this close close to making that program happen that is that's an amazing amazing program um it's we've got to bring up the education level we've got to put back into our communities especially the ones that need it i'm sorry if you live in a gated community that must be nice but you know <laughs> I'll, kids out in the sticks i don't know what that's like kids out in the sticks don't get those opportunities either just as much as the kids that are in the middle of the, the the city we got problem huge problems in multiple places poverty is rampant 
It is. And it, I agree. Every society Sorry. where 1% has all the wealth Things always fails. It will crumble every single time. Oh. And it has throughout history over and over Rome, and over. Russia, France. I mean, I'm not suggesting anybody get a guillotine, but I'm just saying there is a, that kind of a problem. That might be a that might be a solution. No, it's not. We can't we can't be doing that. Why That's, not? Because we got to be. Nobody better listens than that. any other way. We got to be better than that. Like you we publicly gotta... execute one motherfucker, people start listening. You are so <laughs> fucking Texan. <laughs> <laughs> Just, you know. Am I wrong? Am I wrong? As long as we ain't publicly execute nobody that look like me. No, no, right. no, 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 no. We're talking about the top one percent, the richest it's, of the we've richest, got, richest. We got an imbalance around the. <laughs> no, we absolutely do. We absolutely do. Well, and until, yeah. until we understand what that looks like, until we understand what. I mean. Point, right? When you talk about capitalism, when you talk about all these different things, it's like now I can't I can't lie. I mean, I just moved into I have a I have a big house. I have a nice car. Right. But I walk outside now and I'm still hurt. Like it bothers me. When it bothers you that you're doing well, yes. When it bothers you that you're doing okay for yourself. It bothers me to go on vacations. It bothers me to go to the beach where I know I'm from 4300 Gibson right on the south side and 95% of the people I grew up with ain't never seen a, a bigger body of water than the Mississippi River. That bothers me, right? And so when you have these, that's an issue. That's an issue, and, and, and I've met some of these rich folks. I've met some of the richest people in the world. You know, I met I met I meet all these stars all the time now, and I'm, you know, during this whole Oscar run, I was with the, and I just felt out of place. I didn't feel out of place because I was I was broke <laughs> compared to them. I felt out of place because I just felt like our mindset wasn't in the same places. It was two people that made me to, to that, that made me feel like they were human. It was two people. It was um, it was uh, Michael B. Jordan, um, actor, and it was Mark Ruffalo. Mark Ruffalo is an incredible human. Ruff Mark Ruffalo saw me at the Oscar. We had met at a premiere when we were premiering uh, in the same theater. He was doing Dark Waters and I was doing Samuel Superman. We met and we talked and he said, hey, hit me up. And so we started to talk after that and just have conversations via email. We saw each other at the Oscars on the red carpet. Um, I got the pictures on my Twitter and he saw me and he turned around and he was like, Bruce. And everybody turned around like, and people just start snapping pictures. Of like, oh, <laughs> don't know who that is, somebody. but uh, he said his name, so let's get him. <laughs> yeah. We don't know who the hell this guy is. He, he get the pictures this. now. We'll figure yeah, it out this later. This guy in the red suit. And so, <laughs> but we talked, and it was like this genuine. And when I talk to him, it's always it's always love, it's always empowerment, but it's always this sense of, bro, we got work to do. We got work to do. That's the message. You think we've been knowing each other? Same with Judd Apatow. So it's like. You know, yeah, y'all. Yeah, we're on the same page. Um, I'm same glad page. to hear that you did actually meet someone like that. So much of the time in the entertainment industry, we really see the whole La La Land thing happen. They live on a whole other planet. Yeah, they're out of... A oh, they really do. Uh, out of they touch really. with what the world is and how it is and... Then they donate money or they do something, and it's so it feels this, so shallow because they don't. Rather than I, I the, often question that. So listen, the Baftas, um, it's the uh, London version, basically of the Oscars, right? So I was in London at this party, and uh, Joaquin Phoenix walks into the party. And 
Joaquin Phoenix, he's the other person. I should have said his name as well. Uh, I apologize for leaving, leaving him out. Um, Joaquin Phoenix walks into the party and he stands next to me. I turn and I see him. And I said, look, I, I actually like to thank you for your, your role as the Joker. People who suffer from um, mental health issues, um, mm -hmm. anxiety, depression, we will see it a different way. And just know that we appreciate it. Um, although it was very difficult to watch, um, it was needed for a society to understand a few things. He gave me a hug and was like, you know what, that's what's needed. I appreciate it. That's, you know, it, and he, he talked about the stuff that he learned, you know, in the role. And he started to talk about, you know, look around this room. You know, there are no people of color here. Like we have to do a better job. I have to do a better job. He was saying these things to me. And I said, listen, you got the platform. Your voice is strong. That's all I said. The next day, he received the Best Actors Award at the BAFTA and gave the most powerful speech ever about black and brown lives, about um, you know Hollywood and what it looks like and racism and all these different things. And did the same thing at the Oscars. That's what using your platform is about. Yes. Why you got millions of people watching. Because you know, at the end of the day, you're going to be okay. Yes. You as a white man, actor, millionaire, you're going to be all right. So, yeah. I, I agree with you very much, 100%, because it's easy for us it's easy for white people to forget. Oh, are uh -oh. we losing? No, we good. Okay. <laughs> I was, no, I got a I got a text from my mom downstairs. Say, you still on there? Oh, we'll <laughs> keep you all night. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, <laughs> if you need to go, you just tell us, man. No worries. It's all we, no, it's all good. We, we could talk a little bit longer. I got uh, my mom, uh, my stepdad, my sister, my brother was here. He left. Everybody's in um from st louis they came to visit me tomorrow's hmm. father's day i got all my kids and so it's been it's been a time it's been pretty dope so awesome yeah. what what i was saying is it's easy for white people to lose sight we go home we got we live in a mostly white neighborhood uh my husband is not my husband's part native so there's a little bit different perspective uh i mm -hmm. I come from a multiracial family, so I have a bit mm -hmm. of a different perspective, but you know, it's I see it around me. I right. see how easy right. it is. They're just like, but I still got to pay my bills, but you got to speak up too when you can. You know, and yeah. it's it's reaching out and telling everyone. It doesn't matter who they are, where they are, what color they are. We all got to speak up together cuz one voice can get lost in the crowd. Creole, that's a good point. Some people, sometimes it's like that. It is like that. Very much. And it, what happened? It, they go back to their lives. Yeah, people go when back somebody to their uses lives. their platform, does it really work? People see the speech, they, they say, ah, and, and then know, they got, just go back to their lives. They go, instead oh, of... See, that's the thing. You got to keep you using keep your platform. Using it. You don't and just use your platform it. once. And outside of that. If one person saw that speech and changed something, yes, or did something dramatically, you don't know what that one message to that one person is going to do, right? Millions of people watched it, but if one person takes that, if one 14 year old kid watches that, if one 14 year old white kid who's about to go to high school or in high school watches that, changes his whole trajectory, goes through school, goes to college, um has a has a, a a major in something that's going to be you know profound and then does something to change the world right does something to, to to create change and it came from that one little thing if you think about some of the biggest things that have happened in history some of the most life-changing moments it there's so many people that have these these stories of this one little thing or that one person right you know, that made them think differently or to get them. So although I'm very, you know, I'm in a militant mindset and I know, you know, I feel, 
you know, I feel where, where, where Creole is coming from. I'm also cautiously optimistic when people use their voices to captivate because that's one thing that I've been able to do. And no matter where, what happens, if you're able to reach one person, you don't know what that potential positive domino effect could be. It's like throwing a pebble in a lake. That small pebble gonna go in that lake, but those ripples gonna they they gonna go far and wide. And you guys, you got that one friend, you got those people on your Facebook feed that are saying stuff that you're just like shaking your head at. Don't don't unfriend them. Keep putting the Life truth they out ass, there. Yeah. Keep putting the truth Life out they there. Ass. If they leave you, then they didn't want to hear it. But if they keep reading it, maybe something changed. Maybe yeah. something Unless, in the mind changed. And, and and I would I would extend that message. What she's saying, absolutely. But for my black folks. Do not re-traumatize yourself or depress yourself going back and forth on Twitter about stuff no. that we are seeing each and every day. Because I have to unfriend and block a whole lot. Now I'm gonna have a constructive conversation, but once that conversation can't be constructive no more, especially if I'm having a conversation with a white person, I'm gonna have to get them up out of here because it is so traumatizing. Mm -hmm. sitting and talking about something. I just saw somebody die on TV. I just saw somebody die on social media with a knee to his neck that looked like me. That could have been me, could have been anybody in my family. And if I take the step out, you know, take the extra step to try to explain or try to give my no, nah, it's we we've done it. We've done it. We've done it. We've done it. There are those of us who can do it. I'll continue to as much as I can. But now it's time for y'all, pig stand, my new brother and sister. It's time for y'all to take it to a whole nother level to get these other folks to be on y'all level. Because I fuck with the level that y'all on. But we need these other folks going to bat on Facebook, going to back at Walmart, going to back with these white folks to keep calling the police on black folks simply because they black. They can't sit in bird watching a park. They can't sit, we can't sit in our own apartment and eat ice cream. Our kids can't play with toy guns. We can't go to the corner store. We can't, our kids can't walk with Skittles and, and, and iced tea. Like, no, nah, we, we need y'all to sort of turn their ass up. Right, and whatever, the way that y'all doing, whatever way they have to hear the message. If you have to get it to them through, let's talk about the kids. You want your kid to be like that. However, you got to reach them, get mm -hmm. to whatever that level is that they can feel. Facts. And that's where you talk. That's where it starts. Because once you can get past that first hurdle, a lot can happen. Yeah. But we thank you so very much. We know, I, you, we know you gotta go and spend <laughs> time with your family. Thank you so, so much. You're welcome back anytime. We have- Yeah, you hop on anytime you want, man. We have open oh, calls yeah. and uh, every night that we're uh, on. All right, all right, all right, all right. I'll do it, I'll do it, okay? okay. They're, they- no, no, Mike. Look, look, I, just, I, I just got, I got, I got, I got two one Mike P. <laughs> I got two one Mike P. <laughs> Against who, me? No, Sokka. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, nah, Saga 3 0. Um, oh! <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, you know, I battled Mike P a long time ago. We're having Mike P on next week, so, you know. Listen, Mike P is uh, <laughs> Mike P's amazing, dude. That's that's my brother. Um, realistically, I gave Mike P his first shot. I wasn't as, you know, I wasn't, you know, anything special, but I had a slightly bigger name than Mike P. I was like his second battle. Oh, wow. Um, and Mike P beat me. Mike P made me, um, Mike P made me a lot better. Awesome. Um, and he's and he's always been a good dude. And plus, we we both got bowling in common. We both pretty good bowlers. So, so everybody, yes. Um, be sure to follow Bruce on Twitter. Uh, he has a website. Thank you, Raya. BruceFranks.com. Mm -hmm. 
Be sure mm-hmm. to check mm-hmm. that out. Everything you could possibly want to know about the man is right there. Yes. Everything yeah. he's ever done. Life. The whole life. And, and, if, and if I could, um, my organization, 28 to Life, the organ, the website is life 28 life 28org um, It's a gun violence prevention organization that speaks to, um, you know, gun violence from the root cause. So if y'all could check that out. And no, I will never be on URL, ever. Ever, 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 ever. <laughs> no. He said, don't text him because he sucks at texting back. <laughs> <laughs> they still get no, you on that text. I'm about to text. Yeah, I'm about to text him. Um, right <laughs> absolutely. Uh, as, as Texans, we're all for having guns, but we have got to solve gun violence the correct way, which is the root cause. So, absolutely. So, mm-hmm. thank you so much for joining it's us. It's been an absolute pleasure. Man, salute y'all. And hey, I'm I'm always down. Y'all rock with y'all family. Thank you so salute. much. Salute. You have a good one. All right. Enjoy your time with your fam. Man, I'm on my way. <laughs>